So, last podcast in this recording. I might need to ask you about the tortoise now. Oh, so Albert's in the fridge. And um, so what happens is, about October time, yeah. we bring him in from the garden. We bring a bit of a garden in with him because he quite likes his own patch. We, he's, a bit, he's a bit like a vampire in that sense. He likes to sleep on his own earth. Um, so I dig out a little bit of soil, bring him in, put him in a little plastic box, pop him in the fridge. Five degrees, perfect for tortoise hibernation. Stays in there for like 12, 15 weeks, something like that. Um, and then we bring him out and warm him up. Slowly. In the oven? No, not in the oven. No. <laughs> <laughs> Microwave? <laughs> Actually, what you do radio, is you put some sort of like tepid water right. in the sink. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then sort of half submerse him. So it's you can like just defrosting keep... a chicken. It's a bit like defrosting a chicken. Yeah. <laughs> no one knows that there are other guests on the podcast yet. So by keep... <laughs> when, when you keep butting in, you're ruining the banter <laughs> moment, okay? Yeah, pulling away the veil. Um, how on earth did... Tortoises survive between before fridges, ovens, microwaves, radiators. So this, I mean, water. so this is really fascinating, isn't it? Because I, I I did a little bit of research on tortoises since I last joined the podcast. No, 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 no. When I first got a tortoise, right? Because it seemed terribly unfair to get a tortoise without right. learning right. a bit about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and in there in the wild, so ours is a Greek the th- spy spur thighed tortoise. Yeah, try I'm saying, saying that. that. <laughs> Say it all again. A Greek yeah. spur thighed tortoise. Greek. Yeah, so in the in their natural mm. environment, I've yeah. got a great story about that actually. In their natural environment, um, they don't hibernate because it never gets cold enough. So hibernation is kind of an unnatural you thing. You stick him in the fridge even though you don't actually have to hibernate. No, 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 they, no, they do. Anyway, the, they do the here. table is not here. It sounds a bit dodgy, doesn't it? He's freezing a tortoise from Greece. I'm not freezing a tortoise. <laughs> it never gets that cold. Sorry. No, my great story was um, we were. <laughs> We were on a Greek island, I can't remember which one, and um, Anne and the girls were with me. Evie, Evie was quite young and Thea was kind of quite young. And um, I'd Googled things to see on the island and there was Tortoise Mountain, which if you went for a walk up this mountain, you would see lots of kind of native tortoises and things like that. Well, one, it was a long way away from any habitation. No. So, so it took us kind of, the taxi took us as far as you could, and we had to walk a long, long way. Then we walked up this mountain for about an hour and a half. Then we walked down this mountain for an hour and a half with the kids moaning, Dad, we've seen no tortoises. So um, they, they were all in the fridge. <sighs> That's what it was meant Lee Davis and Willem Roberts are the two IPs in a pod, and you are listening to a podcast on intellectual property brought to you by the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys. So, um, so this this is um, a podcast that hasn't quite gone to plan because we've, we've we've lost a guest, we gained two. I feel like we gained. Oh, we gained, yeah. So, so um, yeah, net net gain there. Uh, we were meant to be having a conversation about um, Super Council and joining Super Council in in the hope that it would encourage people to do the same, and um, we're going to do that, obviously. Um, so, let's first of all introduce our two new Super Council people, Debbie. Who are you? I'm Debbie. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Tell, tell, us a, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, my name is Debbie Slater and I'm a patent attorney and I've been in the IP profession 40 years this no, year. No, no, I have, no. I have, yes, yes. Do you, do you spend a lot of time in the fridge? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, so yeah, I started off in, in 1983 as a, a patent examiner at the EPO, so that's how I started off. Wow. I've so forgotten that. You told me that. That's amazing. I did, yeah. yes. And, and then I morphed into an IP manager and then finally came out, you know, like a butterfly. Came out. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, as a patent attorney um, and worked in private practice and in-house. And I'm currently an in-house um, patent attorney for a very small tech startup in, in Manchester. You can name them. It's fine. Prevail. And what, what do uh, they do? And they are in the process of developing wearable tech. So oh, come on, like comfortable, sort of? comfortable gar- so garments that can detect biosignals, ECG, for example, detect it in, in a fashion where you, you wear a garment and you've not got loads of wires everywhere, connected to a very, very small sensor, which is removable from, from the So it's garment. not like the little man bra thing I wear when I play squash to monitor my heart rate. You don't want to do about your man bra. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very comfortable. So the idea is, is that you're wearing something that you don't actually know that you're wearing tech. You're just wearing a very comfortable garment. You have a little pocket, you put in a little sensor, picks up the ECG, processes that, 
sends out the data to your app on your phone and gives you insights into, for example, your heart rate, yeah, heart yeah. rate variability, whatever. The idea is, I mean, we've only been going for three and a bit, well, coming up for four years, so still early days. But the idea is that, yes, we'll develop wearable tech that gives you all sorts of insights about your health, wellness, and, and how your environment is. So I'm one of two patent attorneys in this little tech startup in Manchester. Well, we'll talk a bit more about that as we, um, as we exactly. go on. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, Will, you're a, um, you're a habitual guest on the podcast. <laughs> two now. for two, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, probably should explain first off that you were on the podcast at the, the moment when I invented or created the ride-on gherkin suitcase. Yeah. Not the shard one. No. <laughs> <laughs> the conversation about what shaped suitcase would you sit on? <laughs> <laughs> so we concluded the gherkin was eminently more sensible than yeah, the shard. It's obviously <laughs> clear. So, um, Come on, who, who are you, sir? What do you do? But for those of you who weren't there, uh, my name is Will Burrell. Uh, I'm, I'm a newly appointed member of council. I am a patent attorney by background, so qualified back in 2014 and started the profession ooh, about 2010. Uh, don't have a tortoise. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> since then, uh, just I, I do patents, but I also have um, a specialism in, in designs as well. From my perspective, I, I kind of got into the profession, I think it was in my third year at uni, we had to do our individual projects. And um, so my project was on, uh, you know, Thunderball, when a guy sticks the thing in his mouth so he can breathe underwater. Never seen oh, it. Oh, yeah. yeah. You've never seen Thunderball? You need to see Thunderball. It's, it's, doesn't that happen in Harry Potter as well? Something like that. It does actually. <laughs> it does. Very good. Look at that. I've seen it in there. Uh, so I thought on this project, I, I, I'll, I'll try and like emulate that and try and recreate it. You tried to breathe underwater. What's it called? There's a cool word for it. So rebreathe. That's it. That's cool. <laughs> I think that's cool. But so because of that, now I got in. I got really into it, and then they're like, "Oh, have you thought about doing patents?" And I was like, "What? <laughs> What's patents? No idea." And then, yeah, at the end of that, it sort of that gave me my exposure, and then um, rest is history, really. Thank you. Welcome to the podcast. Um, but we've got two kind of extra special guests who we weren't expecting. Like, so um, let's let's do Ian first. Ian Ross, um, stalwart of Seeper, Mister Seeper, Mister Journal. Yeah, so I'm Ian Ross. I'm the head of publications and content at Seeper. I've been associated with them since November two thousand three. So. Uh, you, there's a lot going on though let's just yeah. let's, let's not play this down you, there's a lot of publications going on um, there mm. is yeah well there's a monthly journal and I sense a plug coming here no. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about just talk us through some publications most oh, yeah. recently we've got a new book on a uh, Grafton Patents. Who's that boy? Nice, a young man called Gwilym Roberts. Oh. Is that, is that G, GV Roberts? <laughs> yeah. GV Roberts. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I think that's worth buying, don't you know, everyone? It's, it's, it's very reasonably priced yeah. and available <laughs> on our, online on our website. Any, any other publications worth mentioning? No. No. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Training manual, as yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was being so interested in that, course, yeah. so, uh, Absolutely brilliant patent training manual by edited by Debbie, who's here, and by Gwilym again, who's oh, here. Oh, Gwilym Roberts. <laughs> yes. Gwilym V. Roberts. Gwilym V. Roberts. Gwilym v. Roberts. <laughs> yeah. so, and, that, and the fabulous Debbie Slater. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And various study guides we do for all the exams. And, and also, you yeah. kind of you dabble in web and. You stick your nose in anywhere where there's content, don't you, really? Uh, yeah, I'm supposed to, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then we've got someone else at the table who I had no idea who he was until about three minutes ago. Super fan. Super fan. Super fan of the podcast. Hello, Ollie. I was planning on keeping you low profile. So yeah, well, I know. <laughs> you're not, you're not that. That. You, um, you, you stupidly introduced yourself. and um, So, come on, who are you? Well, I secretly feel like I've been on every podcast sort of hiding on the table. Uh, <laughs> I'm not so familiar with it. But um, no, I'm um, Pat and Sonny at uh, Kilburn and Strait. I work with Willem. What do you do? What's your kind of special in My special is biotech. Ah. And how did you get into that? Come on, come on, you can't, come on, you know the so podcast. Cla- you classical, need to talk. classical route of um, <laughs> going down the science option, uh, studying the lab's not really my place, um, and then sort of seeing what other options are available and uh, find out about the pattern profession and the rest is history. Cool. So, well, yeah, welcome. So, whoever wants to go first, how did you find yourself getting onto CEPA Council? And you can't blame me. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
somebody suggested that I might be interested in joining <laughs> council. And to be honest, people had said to me before, but I was approached not too long ago and asked them. I thought about it and thought about it and thought, well, why not? So I put myself forward. You know, I'm, I, I must admit, I suffer greatly from imposter syndrome. Oh, don't we all? Mm-hmm. And, you know, the thought of going on council, it was a bit like, well, I'm going to get found out. And there's still time, of course. Um, oh, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, we've found Leo. Oh, we know. <laughs> yeah, but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and that, by the way, is the key to imposter syndrome. <laughs> So, yeah, uh, somebody suggested it might be... So- and, look, I've been involved with CEPA, for, with the Education Committee particularly, and the, the paralegal course for quite a few years now. So I suppose it was a natural progression. We've got a little bit of a similar background, haven't we? Yeah. Like we're, like, we're, we're like proper teachers, aren't we? Yeah, we, I mean, I, I did take time out of this profession to train to be a teacher, um, which was something I'd always wanted to do when I was coming up to being 40 and I thought, well, if I don't do it now, I'll sort of never do it. So, yeah, I took time out from the patent attorney profession, went back to uni. Where did, where, where did you do that? Where did you... Uh, in Australia. Oh, OK. So I, I lived in Australia uh, initially for 12 years and then a further two years, um, about five, six years ago. So, yeah, I, I was in Australia. I was coming to 40, you know, that time in your life and you wonder, you know, Am I going to carry on doing this forever? And I thought, well, I did want to be a teacher, so now I'll have a go. And, and so I did the PGC equivalent and talked to be worked as a teacher of maths for a while. And I absolutely loved it, I must admit. But I got enticed back into the patent profession. Oh, what enticed years. you back? Um, I was asked to help set up a company doing IP management consultancy. So, it, again, it was slightly different and a bit of a challenge. And I'm always up for a challenge, so. I'll, I'll do that. So, so yeah, so I do have that education background, and I'm also um, an antenatal teacher as well. So I'm a qualified antenatal teacher as well. So. Oh, well, can we have a chat afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> so I've done that. I did that for men. I haven't done it for a while. I mean, when you get to my age, you sort of, you know, you become disconnected from that a bit, but... For many years, um, promoting good quality maternity care and, and um, empowering parents in their sort of childbirth journey was, you know, my big thing. So, so I've learned something today. Yeah. So, mate, I've, I've, I've learned something on every podcast we've done. Well, you're too young to be on council. Why have you done this to yourself? So, so I, um, I guess maybe like, like that. I started getting involved with Zipa. I mean, after the informal, you get your qualifications done and um, do that. And then I thought, okay, I'll, I'll join a committee. That seemed like just to tip the toe in. So I started on the designs committee. And then I sort of realised that we write, we write reports and they go to this body seat council. <laughs> Paperwork goes, you never see it again. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then also you see it in the super journal, you see the reports that come out. And I thought, do I apply for this? I don't know. I don't know if I've been in the profession long enough. Um, and then I just, I, I, it, I saw the advertisement that, that um, appointments for CEPA Council were coming and um, I wasn't sure. I thought, for as you say, am I just, have I not been in the profession long enough? And I thought, well, let's just give it a go. It's at the end of the day, if I don't get in, it's because it's been too early or, or people didn't, yeah. didn't think it was the right time. And yeah, I just thought it did actually take me quite a lot just to actually think, yeah, let's go for it. But with retrospect... I'm really glad that I did. We're really glad you did. It was a contested election. What did you put on your kind of resume? What did you What did you want to tell people about that might persuade them to put you on? Well, I, I think it was just to try. The one of the, the the great things with council is that it's made up of obviously patent attorneys, but every person of council, from what I've now learned, can offer their own perspective. And you've just got to be true to yourself as to what do you think you can give to the profession. So I think, obviously, on my side, there was a little bit of designs, but I, I do try and give back. So I've done um, presentations to to various guises or parts of SEPA in the past. So I just said, well, I just want to, to give back. Um, you, did the, you did the most amazing di- designs piece to the IP Power Legal Conference last year. Oh, which made so, no, 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 it was, you know... It, one, I saw how well it went down with the audience, 
But also for me, it opened my eyes up to design. Some, and maybe it's even where the gherkin suitcase came from. <laughs> <laughs> but this was it. I, I think I just realised that, I mean, I've said it before, that you can't, you can't do everything on council. But that's actually one of the great things of council. You don't need to. You don't need to. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure what I thought I would be getting myself into when I joined Zebra Council. But now I'm on it. Like one of the great things that I'm really enjoying is actually just seeing how much SEPA does and how much a lot of the things that SEPA does might go unnoticed to a lot of the people who just aren't involved with SEPA as much as they might want to and, be. And, and I would say for younger professionals in terms, not in terms of age, but career years, because I think Pat Nathan is quite interesting in that um, you come in to the profession not as young people, and I'm not saying you're all old, um, but it's a it's a career of second or third development, isn't it? In terms in terms of what you've been through before, so um, so you're, you're being in your mid thirties, but your your IP career is quite young. Um, it's I think the most extraordinary CPD opportunity because of how just how much you can assimilate through council. It's just I mean the, the, the things like we said the, the things that you you don't you might not understand that, that a CPD are getting involved with. I mean, for instance. CPTPP, I mean, I won't go on too much about that. Yeah, but, you can't um, say any more than the initial. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's that, it's the examinations as, as trainees, it's about the education side of things, it's about, I mean, it just does so much. And I think from, from a learning perspective, from my point of view as well, it's given me so much already and it's just only the start. Yeah. Um, so I think from my perspective, maybe to those who, who just aren't sure about whether to take the dip with CEPA Council... You've got nothing to lose. If you really want to invest the time on it, go for it. How long have you been on council, Willem? I don't know. I've been doing podcasts for quite a long time and I thought I'd give a really short answer. I don't know. It's probably about 10 years. No, it's it's got to be more than 12. Really? Yeah. But it's fair fair to say that early on I didn't necessarily come to every... No, yeah, I, I do remember. So I do remember one of my first... Um, thoughts of you as a council member was yeah. never turns up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, and ne- never ever, never ever turns, turns up. up. No. Yeah. yeah, I did once turn up um, in in our old office, Ollie, and um, I listened in on the. Oh, there's a quite old. It used to be old spider phone thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just on the phone and started. It was also in dictation era, so I forgot. I went on. I came off mute to say something. Decided not to say it. Stayed off mute. Started dictating a response to an office action <laughs> during <laughs> a super meeting. Um, but it's, when, when I got, I very kindly got uh, involved as on sec, I realised that it was a completely different story. And I don't think I've missed more than one meeting since that. No, yeah. To be clear. Yeah. Um, but it was, yeah. But to be, I, I don't be rude about old. Super, if I may, but I think these days we are just doing things that are important. So you, you plug in when it's important. Yeah, yeah I was going to ask you what, what, kind of moved you from being a I'm not saying you weren't committed because I know you used to do a huge amount of work still behind the scenes I did tons of tank committee and all that stuff, stuff. And, and, um, yeah. and you know I used to have conversations about the fact that you know turn up to council meetings then yeah. was not the best use of time and I would yeah. agree entirely in terms of where council was then um, so what 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 was the ooh, I didn't know it's about me you like this what, um, <laughs> no, I, what, what, I, what changed it you know because you did so, I, I remember us having a conversation <coughs> about you getting more involved and you've gone from that to like boom, Mr. Seeper. So <laughs> I no, there was all the Seeper's been incredibly important throughout my career. It really has the journal's fantastic for the, the, the education part and the educa- the information dissemination part. PatCom was really important for influence and for understanding what was going on. Um, again, it sounds a bit rude, but council didn't used to do that much. Sorry. So we're actually on the podcast. However, we're now looking at what's really important to the IP profession in the UK. It's moved on from being a kind of a bit of a closed shop and a bit weird to being what are the really important things we have to worry about? Brexit, trade agreements, education for UPC, IPREG, all the big stuff. And suddenly we're talking about really important things that absolutely impact it. And then moving on from crisis management, getting proactive, actually I think we're moving towards doing what we should do, which is the UK had one of the original pattern professions we do know what we're doing, and suddenly we're becoming this kind of a bit of a powerhouse. Yeah, 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 and I think the CEPA's actually becoming that. I want to go yeah. to those meetings. Those are, those are cool meetings. Yeah, yeah. When, I, when I started out training as a patent attorney, as opposed to starting out in the IP profession, you know, that was late, mid-80s. 
the institute was this sort of remote thing that sort of did things, but you didn't know what. And we had our jur- we had the journal. That was the only contact or we why. had. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. And it's, I mean, I remember in I just joined, and I was very acutely aware that there were very few women in the profession yeah. that I could mm. see. And and I the only way I could see of m- making this point was I wrote a letter to the journal. And I suggested that it might be quite a good idea maybe to have a group for the women in the profession so that they could network. How very dare you? (laughs) And and, and it was published. And then the next month, the replies were published, which which were basically along the lines of, well, I'm a pipe smoker. I think we should have a group for pipe smokers. I can imagine. You know, I am pleased to say that we have moved on from that. And and we are diverse and hopefully we are inclusive. Mm. And we are a much more relevant institute, I think, Mm -hmm. nowadays. And that's why I'm I'm glad to be part of it. Ian, I'd like to ask you how you've seen... Because I've only seen council change from the inside, from when I joined to how it is now. So as, as like a person who's been around secret for a long time and the journals obviously are the organ of council in terms of it's the way it communicates have you seen council change it's changed um it's changed visibly just by looking at them <laughs> <laughs> different people <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 hey, i mean the joke when if you remember andrea's Brewster's secret diary. She says, oh, oh yes. 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 I love that. She's talking about the bearded um, council members. But I was always impressed about the volunteer aspect. That's yeah. amazing. Mm-hmm. And the work mm-hmm. they do for free of time. Um, considering they could earn a lot more money outside of it. So, <laughs> which was quite impressive. But yeah, it's definitely changed. And it's changed. I think the whole way SEPA and council work is better. It's more... Um, Council were there to tell Super what to do. I always felt to see the staff what to do. Whereas now it seems more like a teamwork, really, mm. where they, they all work together to get 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 things done or identify, as Willem was saying, what's important. And, yeah, I, I mean, I think certainly it's coming through from the sort of committee perspective and working in a committee before joining council. You do feel that we're working in a more holistic yeah, yeah. Mm. way. Know that as a committee member, you're actually contributing. That council actually acknowledge what it is that you're doing, and also ask the various committees and volunteers, you know, what can you do to help us? So yeah. that sort of collegiate, I suppose, is yeah, I think, I think that's it. and definitely any also with the staff. The staff are more knowledgeable now. Mm-hmm. Or they're more engage with what the seat was trying to do whereas when I first worked there oh. some weren't quite even aware what <laughs> necessarily IP was so should, should I tell my yeah. should I tell my story yeah. um, so I joined SEPA in February 2012 uh, having been appointed in November um, 2011 uh, and we discussed on another podcast how long it took me to be appointed uh, three times I turned the job down because I I was interviewed and re-interviewed for a job where the SEPA certainly needed to change, and some people had sussed out it needed to change. But because the panel was so large and included so many council members, you got the feeling that there was going to be too much resistance. So I had this ongoing dialogue um, with um, with the person in council who had been put in charge of trying to get me to accept the job. Around that, you're not serious about this. You know, you know, I'm not getting a sense that you actually understand what it is that you need to do. And in the end. Uh, that was Katriona Hamann. Katriona convinced me that, um, that I should take a job. And, uh, and I took the job. But when I came into... I remember coming into SEPA for my first week um, and sat there in my new office and then had a little walk around. And we, had, like, we used to have staff coffee yeah. kind of sessions in the, in the old library, as it was. And it, it didn't take me long to realise that no one in SEPA knew they were working in a membership association, which for me, coming from a big membership association, was really odd. No one had a job role or description or job title that had the word member or membership in it. Um, I came into a publishing house, um, kind of a finance transaction place. Ian yeah. 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 will remember it really well. And I remember sitting there in the first few weeks thinking, what the hell have I done? <laughs> 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 and then 
it dawned on me that actually this was exactly how, how you know, I had the reason I didn't want to take the job was the reason why I had to take the job because these were things that needed to be sorted out. And I think we have turned the CEPA around. You know, yeah. everybody who works in CEPA now is member facing. They all know that they are they are here because of our members. Um, and yeah, we've, we've got the best team. Holly, why aren't you on council? Is, oh is the first question. question. Yeah. And two, what does so you've heard us kind of talk about council from an internal perspective. Is it the same for the members? Are you seeing this kind of change? Is that, that might be the question, I don't know. Yeah. Well, just, just from listening to the podcast, I've, um, yeah, I've learned a lot more about the whole membership, which I didn't appreciate before. And um, I'd, I'd say I'm definitely more, more likely to apply for sort of getting involved in CEPA activities in, in going forward. Um, because just from the pure education point of view, I didn't appreciate all the full spectrum of the activities that went on. Can I ask a question? So if Ollie applies to go on council, for example, how do the firms support them? Do they support them or is it independent? It's not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it's also about Ollie because he's just not here. I'll answer. I'll, so if I can put in a little plug to firms, and I've got some great friends in many big, big old, uh, big and small private practice firms in particular, and also in industry. Um, I think in the old days, it wasn't quite clear why you'd put someone in council. But yeah. now, guys, please put your people forward because mm-hmm. CEPA is working for your firms it re- and for your industry as well. Mm-hmm. And that's really, really important. So if somebody were to come to you and say, I want to go on council or, or a committee, and let's, I'll come back to that, A, just support them because in the end, it's going to benefit the UK profession at large, industry and private practice, which is really important. Um, and second point, committees or council. Either, I think, are really important. I mean, I've always been a huge fan of PatCom. Personally, I've just Pat, I, I love patents, I love policy, I love everything about that, and I want to know what's going on. And the Patents Committee is really important. All these, the Designs Committee, all the different committees, you learn so much, and you find out so much what's going on, and you, you, you find out how to change things. And that's been a really important point as so, well. So, Ollie, when you apply... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's a volunteer dilemma. You are always in a position where you're looking for the volunteers. But, but, uh, mm-hmm. So for me, one of the interesting things about CEPA, so any one of my colleague chief execs would absolutely give at least two limbs for the amount of volunteer engagement CEPA has. And that, so that, the, the one thing that did impress me in those early weeks and months was just how much time the members gave to CEPA. It wasn't always direct, <coughs> directed properly. It wasn't always kind of feeding back into a greater purpose. But what I saw early on was that um, the members really wanted to give back. Really, really wanted to give back. So, so, uh, honestly, seriously, the fact that you know, we've council, we've got 20 plus committees. Um, they're all high octane, doing all sorts of really, really important stuff. Uh, and it all matters. Most membership associations struggle to get anywhere near that amount of engagement. The other thing that most membership associations struggle um, is the sense of belonging that there is at CEPA. So I, I remember in my early days uh, on council, um, just because of my previous experiences, so most of us as chief execs always worry about recruitment and retention. That's, that's it. That's the mantra as an association chief exec, yeah? You worry about getting new members in and you worry about hanging on to the members you've got. And I remember council members saying to me, never worry about retention. They never leave until they die. Um, <laughs> And then you can't tell. <laughs> no, do you remember? We used to have a bylaw that allowed us to strike a member off if they died. We actually had a bylaw, yeah? um, and at the time, I thought, oh, you're just too complacent. But it's true. You know, uh, Fran knows this from um, Fran sat over the side there doing the kind of podcast recording. But Fran knows this from a working membership. Uh, I mean, retention is 97%. Any other membership association plus would kill for that degree of retention. And it is because for pattern attorneys, and maybe it's because it's a kind of a career you grow after you've been in the uh, university system for a long time. It's a second career for many people. Um, it becomes part as much part of you and your identity as anything else. And belonging to CEPA is a, is a big, big part of that. And I've, so I've, I've grown to really appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. When I came back from Australia in 2012, 13, and and the first thing that I became involved with was was developing and delivering 
the nascent new version of the paralegal course. And, and I, I sort of volunteered my time that I'd help deliver the course, but little did I know what I was going to end up doing. And I've been essentially delivering and developing the materials from ever then. Since. And so, ever since. Ever <laughs> since, although I have handed on the reins this year. But, but you're right that in that all of a sudden I became involved in a cause almost, yeah. supporting paralegals, bringing them into the profession, giving them educate, you know, and all of a sudden you become part of a community. You and I very much feel part of the paralegal, and we mustn't forget the paralegals. In yeah. the well, now they have the new <clears throat> grades as well. We've got the whole new membership for yeah. the paralegals too. And, yeah, and we, that we, really, we've, just, we've just gone past 500 paralegal members. If we keep going at the rate we're going, there will be more paralegal members in SEPA than there will be fellows. And, in 10 years. And they are extremely enthusiastic about the Institute. I mean, I'm now involved in developing the advanced course. And again, that's driven by demand from the paralegals within the profession. But it definitely gave me that sense of belonging and that part of something bigger as an Institute. I, I, I absolutely get what you're saying, Lee, in the, you know, that's what we do very well, I think. Yeah, that sense of community and mm. yeah, giving back. How does it feel from a design? Because designs is a bit peripheral, isn't it, Will? How, so how does it feel from... <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I think it, it, it's sort of come along, and this is not just from a, a secret perspective, I think it's, a, it's an IP, uh, it's a wider IP thing that I think, particularly in the last uh, decade, like designs has become a lot more prevalent than it used to be. And um, it isn't just a patent thing, it's also on, on the trademark side of things. Yeah, yeah. So, so Sigma as well, they just have... But they have a, a fantastic design committee too. And it's it's this sort of IP right. And it's a weird IP right because from a practitioner perspective, you you get at designs coming from a background of either being a patent attorney or a trademark attorney. Yeah, you yeah. can't qualify a design, as a design attorney. So it sort of sits in the middle. So, so, so it's all about the invention -y bit or the brandy bit. <laughs> and then you get the designs on the side yeah. for both professions. But I think now it, it is sort of really coming to the fray. But it, it, it raises... Um, I think it, it's a really powerful right, and, and the design committee personally, I think we've really gone from strength to strength and we've got our own challenges. Um, but I, I think that's it. So it's just about finding whatever it is that is your interest. And if you want to give back to, to CEPA, it's just focus on what, what you enjoy most because it will work best if you're passionate about the thing that it is that, that you're doing. We should plug your business, please do that. And also how... the Sounds like they've been quite supportive of what you're up to. Well, this was it, and I think going maybe going back full circle to the point about what would you say to to employers about those who are if their members are thinking about going to mm. to, to join CEPA, um, the the soft skills that you get and and the insights that you get from CEPA and being active in CEPA, whether it's on council, whether it's on a committee, it doesn't matter what it is. It gives so much back to to the individual. And also their wider firm. Did you think that in the last few months you'd have learned so much about political lobbying and campaigning? <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly didn't know that, um, that for instance, that you would be in front of Parliament. And honestly, that, it's stuff like that where people just don't know because yeah. they're not they're not necessarily privy to it. You're chopping that back at Lee, actually, if I can, because you've been asking us all questions. So you come into this, your amazing engagement, the involvement, the volunteers, and everything else. We're very international business. Is that part of it? Do you think that we're always looking out to where the business from the world comes to in Europe? Is that what's bringing us together, do you think? That's, I mean, that, I think that's a really interesting question. I, mean, it's I really, hate to say it when I get a good question. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. <laughs> Probably so, there are component parts to it, aren't there? So there's the fact that IP is pervasive. It's, it's everywhere. So uh, in as much as it will be national, it will be international. Then you get into interesting questions about the UK's position within that and uh, the UK profession's position within that. And we've had these conversations within SEPA recently. Historically, we've focused on an international liaison committee and its activities that needed perhaps slightly more direction, slightly more uh, guidance. But the work that it's doing now in Asia, in America, in South America, um, you know, it's extraordinary work. And it... it it goes on behind the scenes. It's it's kind of happening there. It's them 
we recognised that, um, that we'd overlooked Europe. We'd left it and needed to, to, to reconnect with Europe because we're no longer in it. Uh, not the continent, obviously, but clearly we're still in the continent. I'm not that stupid. Um, but we're um, not physically moved. But, yeah, no, 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 one, no one has dragged the island um, kind of further away from Europe. The English Channel is still the same size. Yeah, yeah. yeah I still can't swim it. I bet uh, you can. I bet you can. <laughs> I fish it. I don't swim it. <laughs> but we needed to reconnect with Europe politically, as in kind of the EU, but also the broader kind of um, relationships that we've got around Europe, the continent. So we, <coughs> so we recreated the International Liaison Committee for Europe, and, and that was a great thing to do. So I think what SEPA has realised in recent years is it needs to do more work to to reflect that sort of the, the preeminent position that it wants to have globally. But for me, personally, that old plumber from Portsmouth, you know, furthest he's travelled is up a train to London. Was, no, he's been to Birmingham. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I went to Warsaw to oversee the EQEs, mate. I, I've, 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 proper, I've properly travelled. Warsaw um, or Warsaw? <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been to both for seat. Oh, there you go. Um, yeah. So, um, but for me, that the... International dimension is really important because the one thing I think I can and do quite well is advocate for the profession, even though I'm not of the profession. I think I can speak for you. So one thing that interests me um, is is for the kind of the, the membership more broadly and looking at you again, Ollie, um, what does, do you think the membership sees super doing? Is it doing the things it needs to do? Is it communicating properly? What would you improve if you had the options? Uh, for me, yeah, it's... <laughs> It's maybe communication because um, it's, it's, it's brilliant. I've seen the development over the years. Um, but one of the things from my perspective is when I first started the profession, it was only really the sort of informal was members and getting involved with CPA in that sort of perspective. But um, looking back, I could have sort of gone for a lot more um, things I was interested in. I sort of encouraged members to do that. Um, so I think, yeah, maybe communication for younger members and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a great point. And um, we've We've started, so the informals have become less form, less informal in that they've come into Big Seeper now, and that does help us with the comms, because previously it was an amorphous group that kind of existed out there somewhere that you, you, that you tried to communicate with. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, I think we're getting there. Would people... This is a really old man, a really old person question. Is email still the right way? I mean, we're sending out emails and we send our mail shots and everything. Is there, are there other routes we should be going through to get... Because... You know, everyone is bombarded with information every day from every, and a lot of it's picked up by your spam filters and everything. But I, what you're saying is you'd like to hear a bit more, which I, I love. But how does it get through? I think you'd be more diverse nowadays, don't you? You know, email communication is, is just one channel, and um, TikTok. TikTok, exactly. Social media. It's, it's Lee sort of, it's doing a yeah. one minute TikTok about what's going on this month. I think that could go very viral. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Ollie. Have you got any other great ideas before we chuck you off the podcast? I mean, I mean even I'm old, too old to use TikTok. <laughs> Should I try and bring us in with my closing question, Grant? Have you got one? I have. I'm just, but I'm just, but I'm just conscious. I'm just conscious that Ian sat right next to me. That's not fair. I chose to leave the ring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. In fact, I did bring your P45, whatever it is, with me. Uh, so I'm going to go you first. Always, it's always, it's always you first. Then I'll get to him, just as right, I'm ready. And then we'll go round, and then of course you'll ask me, because that's just the way it works. I'm ready. Um, so, if you could bring something new to SEPA, a new initiative, a new way of engaging with members, what is it and what would you call it? Oh, uh, easy. Easy. Oh, no! No, I, I would, uh, SEPA would send everybody a virtual reality headset, right? and we would go to our own virtual reality space, once a month, 20 minutes, where we'd all hang out and chat and we would just work on what SEPA needed to do next uh, and uh, settle it by a vote. Uh, what would you call it? Second world. Um, <laughs> SEPA <Super> space. <laughs> Boring. Uh, <laughs> Come back. <I'll> <laughs> that, that's, that's two questions. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be ready when you come back. Go on, Ian. So you've been around a long time. What would be your innovation? My innovation would be... Um, you can just tell you what the question was. Well, <laughs> you've had the whole of me nodding on about the metaverse. <laughs> I 
I will. What would... Um... <laughs> <laughs> I had um, back to the... Back to the I don't know if I'd bring an innovation. I'd probably be more of an initiative. And I don't know what the initiative would be. But I think one of the, 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 the struggles of the profession generally is that when you're at university, no one knows about Pat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it would be something that would allow for better engagement at the university level, how to get people in the profession. So I once had an idea when I joined CEPA, and I had no idea how to take it anywhere, and that was that university students could, and it might be a bit second life could experience sort of the world of IP, so trademarks and everything, through investigating a product. So, they, so take a smartphone, for example, so that there would be something in the university's curriculum that say, here's a smartphone, let's take you through the IP. And it would, it would just enable people to kind of ask questions and divert kind of and so on. Because you're absolutely right, it, it doesn't get exposed, does it, to anyone, ever. I think that's it. Uh, you ask any patent attorney, they will, and you ask them, how did you get in this profession? It won't be the answer you expect. What would you call it? <laughs> He's doing this, he did this to me as well. Uh, patent expose. Oh. <laughs> so it's a bit, I can't even remember what yours was. I'll remember that. But super spoke. Yeah, of course. It was, yeah. Well, uh, re- ready inventor one. Yeah. Uh, or next. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still thinking about it. Yeah. It's sort of a follow on from what Will said in terms of we do need to demystify. You know, if, if I say I'm a patent attorney, most people have no idea. For a start, I then have to say patent. And then sort of they oh, get terrible. it. But but how about getting us we don't see patent attorneys in the media, we don't see them in literature. in dramas and literature. There was a programme years ago with Robson Green and it was called Rocketman. And it's about ten years ago. And he, he was an inventor, and his girlfriend was a patent attorney. Really? Yes. So what? if you look up... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, lean forward. <laughs> Hang on. So, uh, the book Holes, the children's book and the film, yeah. the lawyer in that is actually a patent attorney. So we've but, got to demystify yeah. it. It's not for geeky people. It's, you know, it's really current. It's really important. Maybe trying to promote the profession within mainstream media. Mm. So maybe not the metaverse. <laughs> 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 yeah. Although that's why youngsters these days, you know. Yeah, but I, I think out, we yeah. do need to demystify. We're, you know, Indeed. we're not a bunch of. We need a drama people. called the Patent Attorney. <laughs> 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 so, Confessions of a Patent Attorney. So, 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 I, so I know. I know this one is going out after the earlier podcast we recorded. We were talking about disaster movies and the fact that no one ever, no one ever in a disaster movie says, "Where's the patent attorney?" Yeah, yeah. patent yeah. attorney in the building. Yeah. Yeah. murder in the building. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Netflix is going to be... never call that on the plane either. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not particularly an, an innovation, but it's you know maybe we do need to demystify the profession. Yeah, Ollie, yeah. come on. This is your yes, your moment. You've, 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 waited, you've waited for this. I've been many, many podcasts at this moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, mine kind of follows on for the last one actually, and it's um, I mean you can't go go wrong with um, increasing pub trips. So mine would be called uh, IP in a pub, and mm. we really be aimed at sort of encouraging sort of cross talk um, between different firms, especially because from my experiences, when I didn't, I sort of joined the profession a bit later, and I didn't get involved too much of the Queen Mary usual route into the profession. Um, and I felt like I missed out a lot of the interaction to other firms. I think a lot of creativity and you know, experience sharing can, can, be, can take place if you organise all of those things. And we, as a profession, going back to the volunteer thing, it's a happy profession. We get on with each oh, other. Oh, definitely. Do hang out. It's Absolutely. weird. Absolutely. That's really important as well. No. I've talked to other professions in Europe at least and certainly the States and they just don't have this interaction no. but the, the concept of the informals is seems to be unique oh, in the UK but it's, but it's not unique in the UK it's the, almost unique to this profession really? there, there, there are no other professions that have this sense of an amorphous kind of student learner group mm. who organise themselves that's it's I couldn't understand it I couldn't get my head around it at first it was like mm. what's going on here 
<laughs> it's a huge strength and it explains why it's been such an easy job for you Lee because yeah, we've absolutely. all been here just waiting for you to like, you know soak up the glory yeah. really. <laughs> and we'll just end the podcast there shall we Mike, yeah. I've got away with it <laughs> <laughs> you, you, did, you didn't ask me the question go on then Lee Lee <laughs> hit us so I would I was quite taken with the TikTok thing so I would, <laughs> I would go around the country with a TikTok camera. If such, I don't know how you do these. No, things. this is a special camera. Special camera. Special camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm Max. laughs> no, because yeah. when, when, when I first got into this stuff in FE, we had flick cameras. That you had, you had, to, you had a little oh, camera. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So there was, a, there was a special camera for it's doing these kind of things. Yes, so, yeah. so I'd go around the camera, uh, country with my phone. Um, <laughs> So asking random patent attorneys just to give me like a 30 second um, pricey sort of reflection on them and their work and so on and we would publish them weekly to where on TikTok <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you all for um, for your time really really good um, thank you both for coming no, thank you thanks thank Ian you. for being dragged yeah. across the floor from row 21 sorry it's, a, it's been an ongoing joke throughout the, all of the um, yeah. podcast recordings <laughs> And Ollie, sorry to have lumbered you like this, <laughs> but you can now listen to this one and hear yourself. How cool is that? That's it, but at time in the future. <laughs> <laughs>